Coming up on Digital Music Trends 185, recorded on the 28th of May 2014, the worldwide independent music network versus YouTube, Apple's 3 billion bid for Beats, although of course the actual announcement only came about 5 hours after we taped the show, so more on that in the next episode. I chat with Lyric Finds, the CEO, about their recent deal with UMPG, Audium expands beyond YouTube, analytics company Next Big Sound branches into books with the next big book, Billboard launches real-time charts powered by Twitter, and we also briefly discuss uh, TunePix and the DJ too. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including uh, the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps uh, including Downcast, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and also you can check us out on TuneIn Radio and uh, we have a, a new, newly looking uh, page there which is pretty cool and if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out uh, on what's going on at uh, DMT and about the latest shows you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list again it's bit.ly slash DMT list and don't forget that DMT needs your feedback and if you'd like to comment on a story or point me in the direction of a story that we haven't covered uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, please email uh, contact at digitalmusictrends.com or tweet at digimusictrends and this week I'm super happy uh, to welcome Vicky Norman to the show uh, so hi, hi Vicky and thanks for joining me how's it going? It's great. It's great. Thanks and for having me. It's great to have you. And Vicky has worked uh, in the digital music uh, space for a long time after spending uh, close to five years as president of North America for Seven Digital and is now working uh, on her own consultancy. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. That's great. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, unfortunately, we had a third guest uh, lined up, uh, but uh, he was uh, uh, called away on a, on a school uh, uh, mismatch of calendars. Uh, so uh, totally understandable. But uh, I think it's going to be a bit of a respite for our listeners because uh, I was mentioning to you, uh, Vicky, that the last couple of shows have been well over an hour. So hopefully we can wrap this up a little bit quicker. <laughs> and <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a respite for those that are finding it hard to follow the entire show all the way through. But there is quite a bit of stuff to uh, talk about this week and uh, I actually wanted to start uh, by talking about uh, Vicky your experience uh, you've just come back from Music Matters in Singapore and uh, uh, you know uh, a very exciting conference lots of great speakers and so I wanted to start by asking you uh, about uh, what your impressions were of the event uh, and if you saw uh, any particular trends or uh, elements of discussion that are concerning specifically the Asian market maybe or the global market that you've seen being really uh, strong and present to the event. Yeah, it, well, it was it was a great event, and um, I I'm a I'm a veteran of Music Matters. When I was working in Asia, I went to the first five in Hong Kong, and um, and it's it's a really great it, it's a really well produced event, a really great way to get your head around Asia because that market is is really really complicated. Right. Um, but um, but it was a good event, and the um, and you know I I do have a couple of observations, and one of the I think the the most most um, profound one for me was that when I was doing work in mainland China and in the broader Asian um, region in 04 to 07, it was really, really early days, and right. it was pro- it was probably too early for for any kind of commercial music business in digital to be there. Um, but the the time seems the time seems right now, and um, and there's some really interesting statistics that I learned when I was over there about you know the Asian market is 3.5 billion for recorded music, but the but Japan is three billion, so. Yeah. So there's, you know, the I think the general consensus and listening to Max Max Hole of Universal Music talking was that, um, you know, right now for Asia the 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 money's in in Japan, right. and um, and the market has definitely stumbled and had some difficulty and it's still largely physical. Um, Japan was one of the first out of the gates with uh, mobile music because all of the labels cooperated. But now for streaming and other kinds of capabilities, there's, you know, there there the the market really in Japan really needs to have um, a pretty big overhaul. Right. To, to keep that to keep that domineering position, and we talked about um, it on the show as well. We were talking about the fact that it's been really hard for services to license the music because of the internal players that are not allowing companies to actually get hold of the of the tracks. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's 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 very closed, and um, and so I think that that this is you know there's you know and we've seen this over and over again in the industry in general when there's um, when there are a lot of legacy players, it's really really hard to break that open. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the uh, but the the view is also looking at China and looking at some of these areas where there's you know there there's a leapfrog situation happening where there wasn't necessarily ever a CD, uh, you know, a viable CD recorded music market. There wasn't necessarily even any downloading in China, right. and except for ringtones and ringbacks, that's always been really viable. But um, but the the hopes that there's going to be you know a, a new economy around streaming, which actually makes a lot more economic sense. Of course. There. Yeah, and and hopefully, you know that you know I've heard a lot about new reforms in the law uh, around copyright and and things that are being uh, you know processed uh, you know in, in a very big bureaucracy that is uh, that is China. Uh, if it all comes through, it actually looks pretty rosy as far as new ways of implementing copyright law and and the state actually getting involved in that. Well, it is it is fascinating because publishing was a big public, publishing was a really big part of, of a lot of the conversations that I was having over there, and there aren't you know there aren't legacy and entrenched players, or and there aren't sometimes there may be some publishing laws or collection laws, copyright laws, but there's no actual way to no mechanism to collect. Yeah. on that. And so I think there's a really good opportunity for for some of the systems to be set up from the ground up for the streaming economy. Um, it's not going to be easy, but um, but certainly having, you know, having to untangle things is is always a lot always a lot more difficult than just building them from the ground up. Yeah, and uh, and uh, of course, uh, Ad Peto uh, with Outdustry and uh, uh, Thomas Raymer from AT8 to C88 are two of the sort of only people that I really know that are based in China and, and really sticking it out and and try to make it work over there. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how those companies fare and uh, how the whole ecosystem develops. Uh, and as far as the sort of the, the smaller, uh, uh, you know, markets uh, like Indonesia, for example, the Philippines, was there anything around that? Did you hear over here anything as to how those markets are developing? Yeah, it's really fascinating because as as we've seen patterns in the entire world where each country are, is really developing differently, um, in the sense that we've you know in the West we certainly saw like in Sweden and Norway streaming has proven to be an absolute economic boom to the music industry, putting it in the right direction. But markets where downloads have always traditionally been strong have had a little bit more difficult time getting streaming to take hold. Right. And the US, and the US is a good example of that. Um, in Indonesia, you know, it's, it's another web of, of different countries developing differently. And, um, and Indonesia, for instance, is a really, really strong BlackBerry market. Right. And um, and so it's the, you know, in Indonesia, it's where, you know, people, you know, wait in line around the block when there's a new BlackBerry phone coming out, which is something that we often forget about here. Um, but the um, but each each country is really developing differently. But one thing that I learned that was also really fascinating is that um, the, you know, for a number of years, a lot of the a lot of the labels really pulled back, the major labels really pulled back from the Asia Pacific region, because it just, they didn't understand it, the relationships are, you know, have to be, you know, very long standing, there are carriers, there's just a, a completely different way of doing business. And, um, and now all, all three of the majors have the heads of the Asia Pacific region headquartered in Australia. Which is really fascinating because we've also seen the Australian market go from having no streaming services to having 15. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that and caused a few been, issues. <laughs> yeah, that caused a few issues, but it is at least opening up because Australia was another market where it was it was largely iTunes dominated five years ago, and um, and now there are a lot of new companies that are entering with with exciting new streaming services. Um, so I think I think the fact that Australia has become a little bit of a hub for some of the decision making for Asia Pacific region is actually good because there probably will be a bit more learning, and um, and hopefully that means 
that the that the major labels will be moving in somewhat of the same direction around Asia. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll hear a, a few more reports. Uh, I know Billboard wrote a few reports from uh, Music Matters, uh, but hopefully some videos or something will surface uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, around the conference. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope next year I'll be able to make it. I, I tell myself that every year, and then it's, it, it always uh, it never works out. So it's uh, let, let's see, let's see what happens next year. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's a long trip to Singapore, right? <laughs> it it is a long trip to Singapore, and um, but once you once you get over there, I think that it's 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 such a great event because it, it you know there are a lot of you know there are a lot of self selection uh, criteria going on where people are flying from all over the world to get to Singapore, yeah. and once they're there, they're really open to doing business. There were a lot of international people there this year, so That's it's great. great. That's awesome. And uh, uh, talking about uh, the worldwide music industry, I guess we should break into the first news of the week, and that is uh, uh, around the Worldwide Independent Network, which is an organization representing the independent industry worldwide. Uh, well, they decided to go public with a statement condemning uh, YouTube's practices in the negotiations with independents over the upcoming YouTube music streaming service in particular. So we heard a few grumbles uh, in, the last, uh, few, in the last couple of months uh, uh, around the YouTube uh, rates uh, specifically around the streaming service from independents, but now we get an official statement. Uh, YouTube is said to have already uh, reached deals with Universal, Sony and Warner, but not with the independent sector. So uh, Alison Wenham uh, wins uh, chairs and, and the CEO of uh, AIM, which is uh, the Association of Independent Music here in the UK, uh, stated, uh, released a statement, and I'll actually read this in full, it might take a minute or two, but I think it will, it's, it's pretty important to uh, have all the facts here. So uh, she said, our members are small businesses who rely on a variety of income streams to invest in new talent. They are being told by one of the largest companies in the world to accept terms that are out of step with the marketplace for streaming. This is not a fair way to do business. Wynn questions any actions by any organization that would seek to injure and punish innocent labels and musicians and their innocent fans in order to pursue its ambitions. We believe as such that these actions are unnecessary and indefensible, not to mention commercially questionable and potentially damaging to YouTube itself, given the harm likely to result from this approach. The International Independent Music Trade Association call upon YouTube uh, on behalf of their members uh, to work with them towards an agreement that is fair and equitable for all independent labels. This has uncomfortable echoes of sim a similar behavior by MTV 10 years ago, uh, who chose initially to take a similar approach in undervaluing the independent sector, but who subsequently concluded a dear on felt unfair terms, uh, which lasts to this, to this day. It is for every company to determine their own commercial arrangements, but it is in no one's interest to see independent artists being undervalued in the digital marketplace. So uh, Wenham's uh, sentiments were echoed by uh, um, lots of different uh, heads of independent music or organizations around the world, including uh, Rich Bangloff from A2IM, for example. And uh, this is really a, an interesting position to take because uh, uh, if they came out to this public statement, it kind of feels like there's really a roadblock here in the negotiations with YouTube. And, uh, you know, this service that YouTube was rumored to be releasing uh, already in Q4 of last year is really delayed at this point. And it's going to be hard for YouTube to release it before they manage to get a deal done with the independents. So, uh, you know, do you think that this kind of drizzle that has started to envelop YouTube on, on the independent uh, side of the last few months is becoming a bit of a storm at their end? And how can they deal with it at this point? Well, it's really, it's, it's really, really hard because I think that the, you know, the independent, if you, if you put the three majors and then all of the independents in a bucket. When you look at the independent music, it becomes it becomes really unwieldy because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of labels. Um, and but it, but it's really essential, you know, it, especially when you start looking internationally because the independent music is really where where it makes the difference in terms of local repertoire. So you have to get it, you have to do it, and you have to do it right. And we've seen increasingly organizations like Merlin and others that have that have banded together and have been able to show the economic value that the independent labels are bringing to services. Um, now, I mean, that statement's really really strong, and I think that the um, that the the independent labels have they they certainly have a, a, a right to be able to stand up and say no these are these terms are unacceptable and we're not going to we're not going to accept you know anything that you you pass across the table to us um, but I also think that 
independent music, there's there's it, it really should be put into a couple of different buckets because there's there's truly independent bootstrapped, you know, bedroom guitar players who yeah. are uploading music and distributing it that that may or may not have much commercial value. That's um, your in tune a, core, your city babies and, and yeah. Exactly, exactly. And in you know, and in, in YouTube I don't know, you know, I would imagine that it, like a lot of other streaming services, that it's kind of a superstar economy, so the better known artists are going to rise to the top. Um, but I don't think that, I, I don't think that it's um, a very sophisticated view to put all the independents into one bucket, including self-released artists as well as other, in, you know, independent labels that are like beggars group that are just, you know, absolutely at the forefront. And so, um, so I think that there's, I think, I think that there's, there's more work that needs to be done in educating a lot of the technology companies about um, how to engage with the independent labels. And I think a lot of them, they just say, well, it's an afterthought. They get their deals done with the majors and then they just think, oh, those guys are just going to come along. And um, and they, they, they won't. They yeah. won't. Um, I mean, the interesting thing here is also uh, because of the reaction by a number of different independent organizations worldwide, it also makes me wonder how extensive uh, YouTube is seeking to make this this service like you know a lot of services start out just being you know US uh, centric or US and maybe a UK and a couple of other uh, territories in Europe or Australia for example but here there's so many organizations that are listed as uh, sort of adhering to this statement and saying that they are also experiencing the same problems that if it almost feels like YouTube is trying to go worldwide right from the get-go like that would be really disruptive right Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think I think all eyes are on YouTube right now to see what they're going to do, um, how that service is going to impact, what what that's going to mean to the funnel of YouTube, and um, and I you know I think one of the most interesting things about it is that you know YouTube is free, it's accessible, anybody can click on a link and share a link, and there's no you know I don't need to subscribe you know and be able to get all my friends to subscribe and all the all you know all of those gating items that have limited other streaming services and be, right. in being able to freely share that so I think I think the devil's in the details a little bit on <laughs> yeah. what YouTube is you know what what the impact of this is going to be and and you know how how stuck in the the licensing tar pit they will be yeah. um, before they can actually get something legal out the door. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, without forgetting that, of course, uh, whilst YouTube is the largest uh, 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 you know streaming service in the world, in a sense, uh, uh, it also doesn't have a precedent when it comes to this type of streaming service. And so, you know, it has a huge amount of leverage, which is why it managed to get deals done with pretty much everybody, including Merlin and a lot of publishers when it comes to the actual YouTube service. But when it comes to the streaming service, I, I think rights holders are very wary of repeating the same mistake uh, in giving YouTube that leverage. So I think uh, now that YouTube has to play by the rules because it doesn't have this sort of uh, DMCA uh, style, uh, you know, approach that can, can help it uh, in the negotiations, uh, then I I think uh, uh, right holders are going to be a, a lot more, uh, uh, you know, demanding in, in the rates that they're yeah. given. And so that's yeah. going to be... It's going to be a fun one, I think. <laughs> Over the yeah, last, yes, the exactly. Months. I <laughs> yeah, think so too. Uh, yeah, the last time we talked about it, uh, uh, the reports were that YouTube was, uh, probably YouTube itself leaked it uh, as uh, it being a problem with the product itself, that they were trying to figure out a way to display tracks properly and giving a visual elements to tracks that don't have videos, for example. But I think that also hides the fact that they were having serious troubles on the licensing side. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they couldn't really yeah. get the service off the ground. And uh, uh, we had another uh, rumor on the Apple Beats saga. I, I feel like I should have some sort of like a, a jingle now at this point, uh, uh, an Apple Beats jingle because it's been going on for now five weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, the long debated acquisition of Beats Electronics and Beat Music uh, is Beats Music is reportedly going to happen according to the New York Post and will be announced this week again. We don't know if that's going to happen or not, uh, but I hope it won't be in the next 10 hours. Uh, otherwise, the podcast is going to be out of date by the time it comes out. <laughs> and so the New York Post states that the purchase price has been reduced by 200 million to 3 billion, which is still a very good price. Uh, and uh, it's likely that the reduction was uh, uh, linked, uh, at least in my opinion, to a revaluation of Beats Music. Uh, since according to the reports uh, that were leaked in the last few weeks, uh, Beats Music has only uh, got about 111,000 subscribers in spite of the 
companies and AT&T's efforts uh, to market it to a mainstream audience. So, uh, you know, uh, that might have been the case. It might also be that Apple reduced the price out of spite for Dr. Dre's uh, uh, perhaps inappropriate videos stating that he was the first hip hop billionaire in a fairly raunchy way, which is not really Apple style. So, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Vicky, can I ask you what the sentiments were aside from these rumors that, of course, we can't really substantiate in any way? Uh, what kind of sentiment uh, you felt there was towards this uh, uh, acquisition, if any, at Music Matters? Have you heard people talk about it? And what is your, what is your take? Yeah, pe yeah, people were definitely talking about it. And there was a lot of head scratching, quite frankly, and um, from, from people who... Uh, you know, we're running some of the streaming services, some of the, you know, you know, rights organizations. And I think, you know, I think there's general speculation of, um, you know, the headphones actually really make a lot of sense right. because they're the best selling headphones. Apple already sells them. They have a, you know, an iconic look and brand and, you know, you slap some app, you know, app beats by Apple or, you know, that that type of thing on it, and it really fits with the portfolio of what Apple has. Um, now, you know, the question of, well, couldn't Apple build high-quality headphones if they wanted to? And I think the answer certainly is yes. Um, but this jump starts them. I think it also puts them in the right, it, it puts them into directly into the right demographic and in, exactly. in a younger urban market and they don't have to build that brand. It can augment their own brand. Um, but the, you know, the interesting thing about Beats is that I've always maintained from when I worked at Sonos, I got to learn a lot about the, you know, channels and channel conflict and, you know, and Beats having both the headphones as well as now a music service that kind of introduces a lot of channel conflict into places like Amazon and Apple where they have competing services. And, um, and so it, it, you know, you know, I also, I also believe that if, you know, if Apple wanted to build an on-demand streaming service, they could certainly do that. Right. And, I, and so I, I don't think that, that any of this is probably like, oh, you know, one, one side of this acquisition is, a, you know, is a, you know, is the, is the killer reason. I think it's a mix of a lot of them. Yeah. And, and it's um, been also said that, uh, you know, that Apple may, may have wanted to acquire a third party service so that it could keep the two separate for some time while it tries to understand how it can phase in streaming and phase out downloads. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 is, it is fascinating because when they launched their radio service, I think that one of the, um, I think they intended it, or it's, it certainly seemed like it from a product implementation that they really wanted that to be very tightly integrated with purchasing. Right. Um, but what, what, what really happened is there was somewhat of a cliff and that when they started that, the people just stopped purchasing. And, um, and so then they're, you know, I would imagine they're probably looking at that and saying, okay, well, well, how can we better monetize this? Because, you know, you can't, you can't monetize free very well. And, and Apple already has all of the consumers, you know, that are, that are using their devices in their, in their ecosystem. Yeah. But I, I think the other important element to this is that there was a lot of discussion in Singapore was around, um, you know, Apple post Steve Jobs. And Steve was really a visionary and he very much had his, you know, had his um, eyes is closely focused on brand and entertainment and culture as he did in industrial design and, you know, shipping great products. Whereas um, we, we don't necessarily see that with, with Tim Cook. You know, he's a supply chain guy and he's really, really um, much more of an analytical thinker. And so there was a lot of speculation when I was in Singapore about um, whether this was the, you know, also a big aqua hire of getting Jimmy and Dre and artists and more of the creative side of it back into the Apple world. I could kind of argue that e either way. Um, but I think there's, I think there's some merit to that. And I, and I do remember at South by this year during the iTunes festival, there was an Interscope showcase, right. which I thought was really, was, which I thought was really interesting because that, that wasn't something that I would see as typical. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's the, that's the interesting thing about this story. I think you can argue, I could argue, uh, equally well, 
uh, a point for Apple buying Beats and a point against Apple buying Beats. So yeah. I think at this point we're just gonna have to wait and see how it shakes out. I mean, from from our perspective, somebody has worked for for a service that was primarily focused on, on downloads uh, for a long time. You know, how scary is it to the industry? We've talked about this a lot on the show in the last few weeks. How scary is it for the industry? The prospect of Apple shifting to a, a stream model from downloads. Well, I think I, I think it is really I think it is really scary, but they're but they're also late to the game. Um, now, I think that you know the biggest advantage Apple would have is that they have you know by far the lion's share of consumer accounts in the world where people have the ability to purchase on their phones and you know and, and very seamlessly integrate into their phones. Um, but I think that I I, I think that. The you know the ability to get a streaming service to have a lot of traction, the ability to build a great feature set and really get a sticky user experience. It's hard. It's very very hard to do, and we've seen so many companies try that and fail. Yeah. Um, so I think you know Beats is Beats Music is just barely barely out of the oven and um and i actually think 111,000 subscribers that's really not bad for for the length of time that they've been live in the marketplace um but the um but i think that the the you know the world is you know is 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 looking at streaming as the future for the global music industry and you know having apple jump into it i think is is probably something that that solidifies uh for everyone that there is going to be streaming and subscription as um you know in the marketplace for the foreseeable future yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, last week, uh, um, uh, moving on from from the Apple Beat story, uh, last week uh, uh, Lyric Find announced a very interesting new deal with Universal Music Publishing, uh, so UMPG. And I actually caught up with the Lyric Find CEO Daryl Ballantyne uh, last night. He was in uh, Tokyo, so we couldn't do this uh, uh, live on the show today, unfortunately, uh, to hear all about it. So here it goes. It's a real pleasure today to welcome the CEO of Lyric Find, Daryl Ballantyne. So hi, Daryl. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. It's great glad to, to have you. Glad to join you. And uh, you're all the way from Tokyo, so thanks for making the time. I know it's late your end, but uh, uh, I wanted to uh, chat to you about a deal that was announced uh, this week. So uh, your deal with the Universal Music Publishing Group. So can you tell us a little bit about that and uh, uh, how it came together? Sure. Well, we've, we've been named as the sole third-party uh, company able to license Universal Publishing's lyric rights. Uh, right. So... Uh, they'll still be able to license directly, but anyone wanting to go through an aggregator or someone other than Universal directly, uh, we are now the the only authorized third party able to license that. So it's obviously very exciting for us and, and a wonderful uh, honor uh, for them to choose us. Sure, uh, and you've been working with started, them for a long time, right? Yeah, we've been working with them since probably 2006 was when we first uh, did a deal with them. They originally opted into our first uh, deal with HFA uh, for the U.S. only at that time, and then we expanded worldwide, uh, probably 2009. Right. Uh, and now uh, we we've done the uh, the exclusivity deal. Uh, so it's it's pretty exciting. It uh, it came together. Uh, started off in the fall. Um, Universal sent us uh, an RFP. Uh, saying that they wanted to have a single provider uh, to license their lyrics and uh, and how would we like to work with them on that and what uh, what would we offer and what would uh, uh, what type of cooperation would there be sure and of so course. then we went through a a long selection process and a lot of back and forth but in yeah. the end uh, <laughs> they chose us as as the best provider out there and uh, it's, it's great because of course you know you provide them a back end of of tech that they wouldn't have themselves and, and also the relationships and, yeah. and everything else yeah it's a combination of, of the technology both the apis and the royalty processing systems uh and also the data the lyrics themselves that that someone like universal doesn't have yeah uh most publishers don't in fact virtually all of them don't actually have the the lyrics themselves uh, the interesting thing is also uh, from an international standpoint you have quite a big expertise you know you're present in over 30 different countries and that must be a massive headache as well for a license holders to try and track those royalties and how they all split off in different tangents when, when they go internationally right 
Oh yeah, it's a massive headache for us too, but it's it's part of our our service and our reason for existence. So uh, it is certainly very complicated, and we track royalties on a country by country basis and usage by country, and the ownership splits by country, uh, which turns into a huge data problem that uh, Mohammed, my co-founder and CTO, uh, has to deal with constantly. Right. Luckily, I don't have to. Uh, sift through all of the, the issues that come up there, but he and his team uh, go through all of those headaches and make sure that everything is properly tracked and accounted. And uh, and that system on its own is highly, highly complicated and data and computationally intensive. Yeah, sure. And so looking at uh, the deal itself, you know, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, is this something that you'd be open to work uh, with other uh, uh, publishers uh, um, on, along the same lines if, if the opportunity came, came up? Sure. I mean, we're always open to exploring it uh, and, and discussing that with, with publishers. Um, it's not something that we put a lot of thought into before, before this when, uh, when Universal proposed it. But yeah. It's definitely something that we would be willing to explore. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so uh, going back to uh, something that came up a couple of months ago, whilst we're here, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, work you're doing with uh, BandPage right now. So can you tell us a little bit about that and and how you, uh, what kind of synergy you're looking at here? Sure. Well, the BandPage deal is uh, uh, is a really interesting one for us in that it helps a lot of our clients to monetize their their service and provides uh, additional content and the ability to to build in useful content uh, for the users of their service. Yeah. So what we're doing with with Bandpage is uh, they have a service called Bandpage Experiences where uh, they're aggregating potential like one on one or exclusive experiences with an artist, whether it's uh, a backstage meet and greet or doing a a Skype call with a with an artist or maybe it's exclusive merchandise or all sorts of different possibilities like that that create uh, really intimate uh, relationships between an artist and their fan. Uh, so we've integrated the feed of that content and those uh, those experiences into our service so that our clients can connect to the band page service through us uh, and see what are the relevant experiences for a particular artist uh, when somebody is viewing the lyrics or on re related pages and offer that content and those experiences to their users. And if somebody comes yeah. through and and buys one of them, then our our client, uh, whoever's displaying the, that content, gets gets a revenue share on that and, and earns some money uh, to support their service and obviously support the artist. That's so most of the money goes back to the artist, of course. And it's really interesting to see how uh, there are so many different avenues to uh, uh, monetize lyrics when you look beyond, you know, the the standard, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, ad supported yeah. sites. So that that's that's quite fun. Yeah, and if you if you look at someone who is viewing a, a lyric page, they're generally somebody who who is much more interested and much more of a fan of the the music than just a passive listener. Right. Uh, so. Right something like experiences are much more likely to appeal to them than the average you know, person listening to to radio and it's just on in the background and they don't have a particular attachment to that artist or uh, or those types of situations so we really feel that people who are looking at the lyrics are are a much more active and avid fan uh, of a particular artist that's great. Well, uh, Daryl, thanks so much for the update on Lyric Find. It was uh, well overdue, and I uh, hope you have a, a, a good stay in Tokyo. Thanks a lot. It was good to talk to you again. And uh, uh, Vicky, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, Lyric Find and the world of uh, 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 lyrics, but also of music publishing, uh, uh, it was interesting to hear Daryl talk about the fact that uh, uh, UMPG needed, uh, uh, you know, Lyric Find to do a certain number of things. And also, uh, a lot of publishers don't have a full database of their own, own lyrics. So there's a lot of confusion uh, confusion around rights. So did you hear any anything ar around that on Music Matters? And uh, how do you feel that publishers can solve these problems around databases. I mean, I experienced the same thing when I was trying to license uh, uh, large catalogs for music publishers. It, it was really difficult. It's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. And and music publishers are sitting on uh, a mountain of impo really important rights, um, but they 
don't necessarily have all of the pieces that they need in place to be able to actually make those rights useful in right. the marketplace. And, um, and that includes metadata that can be matched to the sound recording metadata and it also includes the actual lyrics. And, and you know, I've known Lyric Find for a number of years and I didn't know that they had to, they had to make up you know, and and actually annotate a lot of the lyrics that they have because the you know the the actual lyrics just don't really exist anywhere. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's it's a very fragmented industry, and it's uh, it's always funny, like even to hear of of a major uh, publisher that doesn't you know all the contracts are still on paper. There aren't centralized digital databases, so there's so much work that needs to be done on that on that end. And uh, I guess because the, their income streams have been relatively protected uh, so far, there hasn't been too much investment going into building that infrastructure. But hopefully, in the next few years, we're going to see a, a lot more of that happening, especially. Uh, in, in the offices in, in LA where, where you are right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think UM, UMPG in particular, they are, you know, they're really trying to wrap their heads around what the, what the future, what the future opportunities are. And yeah. I think they, they, you know, they were one of the very first publishers when I met with them, when I first started meeting with publishers when we were doing licensing for on-demand streaming, that, um, that they, you know, immediately said, you know, we feel like we're leaving a lot of money on the table right now. Yeah. And, um, and it was actually really good to hear that because it's true. Um, and, uh, and, but I also think that there's, there's a, a really, really deep problem around things like metadata, which are not easy to solve. And, um, and I certainly hope that the more UMPG starts getting involved in, um, in licensing new models and really embracing that, that they'll serve as a leader. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're talking about leaving money on the table. And one of the stories that I want to talk about today, I actually tried to get Jeff on the show, but uh, I don't think he could make it, uh, was Audium. So uh, Audium has announced uh, the expansion into publishing administration. So the company was uh, started as a way uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, publishers uh, and labels and artists recouped uh, uh, all the different types of royalties that might be due to them uh, on YouTube. Uh, but now Ed Chrisman at Billboard reports that the company has started offering music publishing the ability to audit, administer, and license interactive scan and match lockers and other hybrid digital music services, which include Spotify, Google Play, iTunes Radio, uh, and Match, uh, RDO, Deezer, Rhapsody Beats Music, MediaNet, and Move Music. So uh, Jeff Price stated that uh, the existing uh, mess of uh, missing and bad data has uh, misallocated or stopped payment of hundreds of millions of dollars owed to music publishers and artists. The trick to finding and collecting money in the new digital music industry is matching metadata, point database architecture, and copyright law. Uh, by fixing this problem, we're able to find, unlock, and administer a huge amount of money uh, our customers would otherwise not have gotten, all while removing liability for the new music services. So uh, Audium developing an interesting technology there that is really raising a lot of uh, heads. They managed to get a, a decent round of funding in with, from some really interesting people. They got a lot of clients already going for them. And uh, uh, so do you feel like this, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, some people were arguing whether Audium was just a gimmick, whether the technology was actually there, but it really feels like there's a lot of momentum behind the company. And do you think that we're going to see some some uh, copycats also coming into the market. We've, we've seen a few already. Yeah, ab absolutely, and um, and I, I I think that. I think Jeff is exactly right. I think there is a lot of money being left on the table. I also think that I like to talk about the you know music streaming services as being the most beautiful house that you can imagine walking into, and then the plumbing is is just the most atrocious leaky plumbing imaginable. So you're running the water upstairs saying, "Wow, this is beautiful." And then it's just everything's leaking out. And so right. there's you know, you know, there's there's money that is being that is not able to be paid out because you can't get 100% licensed on a song and you need you need all of those rights to fit together. Um, so I think that I think it's really smart, and I met another company when I was over in Singapore, and it's a Russian company that they've built some. They built an application called Heaven Eleven, and it's also a matching service, and it's something that they started in Russia because they're actually 
wasn't a society to collect and and pay out anything on the publishing side and so they started it up and i got a demo of it and it's actually really great um, awesome. it's, um, and so I, you know, I think, you know, when you look at what Audium is doing, you look at new companies that are coming into it. And then you also look at CSAC's recent bid for HFA, yes. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room in that side of the business to clean it up and with better technology and pa start patching those, uh, patching those leaky pipes. Yeah, and it's going to be in uh, incredibly interesting to see how uh, this bid from CZAC on HFA goes. Uh, this was announced on the 23rd, which was just a few days ago, actually. And uh, uh, HFA, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, the Harry Fox agency, and it's one of the, on the, the only organizations, actually, uh, organizations actually that holds uh, aggregate data on publishing information for tracks. Uh, uh, you know, there's not that many, there's probably like an, another couple of companies that do similar things, but HFA has got a very extensive uh, database on that. So you can yeah. actually go to them and ask them, you know, who owns, uh, uh, you know, the this David Guetta track or whatever, and they're going to be able to tell you the uh, the different publishers that have them, and they also have some split information as well. Uh, so uh, you know, this is this would be actually interesting because HFA has been relatively independent, although it was under a number of different bodies. In any case, I think it's uh, closely related to the uh, NMPA as well. Uh, but to see it go under CESAC, uh, it would be uh, interesting because we don't have other organizations that are doing similar things. So it becoming part of a collection society, sort of, it's a bit like, uh, you know... Um, when, when was it Google? When, when Google acquired the other company that was doing something similar? Oh, Rightsflow. Rightsflow, Rightsflow. yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, suddenly that, that big database wasn't quite so accessible. Of course, CESAC is a, collect a collective organization, so it's a different thing. But I don't know. Uh, do you feel like that it could have it could really affect the 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 access to information or, or not and uh, you know also given that the uh, global repertoire database that we were all hoping would happen is not happening right now right right the GRD yeah. is uh, is is stuck it's out of funding and I think I mean I I was at an a, I was at this WIPO sponsored roundtable in um, Christiansand in Norway and it was all about the GRD and the MRD and trying to get a single registry to identify all of the songs and you know and and on the one hand that sounds on the one hand that sounds um, absurd but on the other hand you think about every computer that we have in the world has an IP address has a unique IP address associated with it um, you know there's there's really no reason why this this hasn't this isn't being done um, but I think that I, I think that the you know, with HFA, it, you know, I think what I've seen there is is a company that has um, you know steeped in in the old world, and they are making really really great efforts to become much more modern in the way that their database operates and yeah. the way that their you know the way that their systems work. But it's really hard, and so. I think that w what we've seen over and over again is companies that are that are set up in the music space and they serve an absolutely critical need in a period of time and then the market changes and it can be a mix of their business model it could be a mix of their technology or it could be just the mix of the approach of how they see the world yeah. and um and they no longer serve that that purpose and I have to commend CSAC because I think that for them doing this, I think that they're one of the, you know, one of the collecting organizations and performing rights organizations that also has recognized that if they don't do something and change, they're going to become irrelevant. Yeah. And um, and so I, you know, in that sense, I really do applaud it. Um, whether it's whether it will really be successful and technologically proficient enough to be able to match the needs in the marketplaces is, is, is another question. Yeah, sure. And uh, just to uh, dive a little bit deeper into the story for the listeners that are interested, uh, the uh, HFA is uh, owned by NMPA, the NMPA. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it was established by the NMPA uh, to begin with. And uh, the bid is uh, rumored or uh, considered to be between 30 and $40 million. And so it's going to be interesting to see how uh, this shakes out in the next few days but it might take a, a little bit longer for uh, it's, it's not a it's not a 
straightforward tech acquisition. So it's, it's time, timelines are not quite as quick as uh, we might expect when, you know, the rumors are that Apple might uh, purchase Beats and then it's uh, stuck for five weeks. <laughs> well, there's, yeah. a, there's also, there's also you, know, uh, you know, floors and floors of filing cabinets and boxes of paper in the Harry Fox offices. And so, you yeah. know, you think about... <laughs> You think about that, like that's that's not your typical t- typical tech acquisition. <laughs> no, <laughs> where, where you're going to acquire you're going to acquire a, quite a quite a robust collection of file cabinets and paper. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, uh, although I couldn't see any filing cabinets at their at their at the office floor I visited on Wall Street uh, uh, last year, I think, when they just moved. Uh, so yeah, uh, they must they must keep them on different floors. <laughs> 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 and uh, and so uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, what do you want to talk about? Uh, oh, actually, next big sound. It's quite a big news from them. They uh, announced that uh, they've launched a new venture called Next Big Book. Uh, so uh, the name kind of says it all at this point. Uh, you know, the company is expanding from its uh, music analytics service uh, uh, to uh, serving the books uh, publish uh, book publishing industry. And they've been working with uh, Mac Millens uh, for the past eight months uh, to develop uh, a service that uh, has adapted uh, to the needs of uh, uh, the book publishing industry. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was actually uh, pondering uh, with some friends uh, of a, like a, maybe a South by, we were wondering, you know, uh, where is Next Big Sound going? Because now they have deals with almost all the big players in in the at least in North America uh, for analytics. And so, uh, how can they grow scale wise? You know, how can you scale a company when it's already got deals with so many people? Uh, and you know, a vertical uh, expansion makes complete sense where they can move the same uh, analytics into different industries and, and just adapt them to make them relevant to uh, to the book industry in this case. So, uh, do you think that this was the you know, I, I, uh, as I think that the right move? Move and uh, can you see them moving into more sectors uh, after that? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting, and I think most companies that work in most companies that work in music um, are always looking to diversify uh, because it's it's tough when you have a supply chain that's as problematic as as we have in in with you know music labels and PROs and and um, and publishing organizations. But I think that a data company of all is probably the the best position to be able to go into another vertical. Yeah, um, because with with, you know, with licensing and with with rights acquisition, I think what a lot of a, a lot of companies that have that have tried to go from music to add you know adding film and books and ebooks and other kinds of things, I think that what they've found is that these industries are all really really quite quite different in in you know in terms of you know how they license their media types out, what kinds of windows, what kind of constraints they have, their pricing mechanisms, the amount of control they have, the number of outlets. Um, so I, I think that, that that has proven to be a lot harder than most companies anticipate on the actual licensing side. Yeah. Um, so I've always been an advocate. Yes, you need to you need to diversify, but you you know you know you may you may not be very successful about it depending on how your how your company is architected. Yeah. But I think on the data side, I think there's actually a lot of merit there because the you know the 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 book industry uh, you know. Music has definitely been the canary in the coal mine in in digital, and you look at what's happening with books and with Amazon and the you know the 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 power that that sits between the actual book publisher and the retailer, um, and some of the new services that are coming out that are you know all you can eat and that are subscription type services. Um, they need they need to understand better understand their digital consumers and how they're behaving so that so that they know which kinds of levers they should be pulling in. Yeah. their licensing and their offers yeah and also like the booking industry feels to me like the most similar to the music industry when it comes to the actual uh, granularity and volume of releases in the sense that you know you have all, you know all the way from the the, the major book publishers to uh, authors that are self-publishing on, on on Amazon you have this huge breadth of, of, of uh, potential customers there and uh, differently I guess uh, from the mu- movie industry in the sense that the movie industry as much as you have a lot of independent filmmakers you're never going to have as many independent movies being released that you have as we have independent books just because of the constraints of, of and the costs of the medium and everything else and, and the yeah. time required to put it out so 
in, in that sense, it makes, you know, in my mind, it makes a lot of sense to go into books because, you know, you really have millions and millions and millions of potential uh, customers there and, uh, uh, you know, a few huge players that could land you big contracts. So uh, good luck to them. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And, yeah. uh, and you know, uh, it's, it's really tough when you get to that stage, uh, you know, a really established company, you have a great tech, uh, but you are stuck to, to one vertical. You're like, what do you do? And, right. <laughs> and we saw that yeah. actually with CD Baby. CD Baby actually managed to do pretty well out of the uh, opening of a book baby uh, so that's another yeah. company that uh, managed to diversify into books that way and uh, uh, finally the last big story that I want to talk about was Billboard and uh, the new real time charts in partnership with Twitter uh, they were announced just a few hours ago uh, the first is called the Billboard Trending 140 it makes sense uh, due to the characters of the tweet uh, which measures the most shared songs in the United States by acceleration over the previous 30 minutes with the ability uh, to go back and look at the trend over the past 24 hours the second chart is the emerging artists one which according to the Billboard's F uh, FA AQ includes new and developing artists who are defined as those who have fewer than 15,000 Twitter followers and have not yet appeared as a lead artist in uh, the top 50 songs on the Billboard Hot 100. So I looked up the definition just because I thought uh, emerging that's artists... A, that's interesting. Yeah, emerging artists is, is always a hard category to define. So I thought I'd better actually look it up and see what they are defining it as. And uh, uh, for, uh, for both charts, uh, there will be a weekly roundup, which is going to be published on Billboard magazine, of course. And uh, Billboard will be picking up on uh, a variety of different sources in terms of uh, tweets uh, you know it's difficult to figure out when people are talking about a track of course uh, uh, again I looked up the FAQ and it says that it's going to be tracking links to tracks shared from several music platforms which include Spotify, Vivo and iTunes at the moment they will also track the use of the now playing or NP hashtags and other similar hashtags uh, uh, with the name of artist and track name in the tweet and then they're going to consider that as part of uh, uh, this chart and also the use of various terms associated with the song and song playing uh, this is more obscure uh, says, such as music song track listen but I guess that would have to include the track name and the artist name as well for it to count I'm not sure uh, so the, these new charts actually seem deliciously hackable in the sense that uh, uh, you know we've seen a lot of artists uh, doing sort of Twitter unlocking campaigns to make sure that their hashtag was trending and if there is a chance here to actually get uh, nab a spot on a billboard chart I, I can imagine a lot more artists wanted to get into this game of uh, of getting fans to actually uh, you know specifically at a specific time uh, you know uh, release a, a number of tweets uh, with uh, uh, the track uh, that is being shared and make sure that that artist climbs the billboard chart so uh, w what do you make of this and and do you think that it makes any sense uh, uh, you know or is it is it too easy to to hack <sighs> Well, it does seem like it does seem like you could game the system, doesn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> but but you'd probably have to have uh, enough of a critical mass of, of followers and right. and you know and people that were engaged in order to do that. So I guess so in that sense, maybe you deserve it, right? Right. There's there's a little bit of control there. I, I I mean I think it's I think it's really interesting that 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 Billboard and 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 Twitter have 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 come together on this because I think that. You know, Billboard is I, Billboard is such a legacy, uh, you know, legacy name, and it has such a it has such a brand identity with music. Um, but uh, you know, the Billboard charts don't mean the same thing that they that they did, and that has certainly evolved. That has certainly evolved over time. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what you know exactly what this would be measuring though and I think that when you when you think about the billboard charts you know it was about sales and it was about um, it was about the you know music really really rising to the top over a period of time and I'm not sure whether what you know we're, we're we are really we're a short attention span culture but it's what the last you know trending in the last 30 minutes I mean that's that's really crazy and and how would how would an artist manager or a label or um, a self-managed band really act on that how would they right. say okay you know <laughs> how how can you make that meaningful how will that translate into um, plays on a subscription services or purchases or vinyl or buying tickets and touring and yeah. um and I think that the I think that what we've seen with music over the years is that the artists who can sustain some level of critical and and cultural awareness over a period of time are the ones are the ones that can actually build a viable career. Right. And um, and so just having something that 
pops into that pops into people's stream of consciousness, um, and then it, you know it goes away. That I, you know, I, I I'm not sure how relevant that would be, but I I kind of like the fact that they're that they're doing it because it certainly puts billboard, billboard back more into our. Uh, our current society than it is right now. Yeah, exactly. And I have a couple of points of that, actually. You know, on the one side, it, bill, it benefits Billboard, but it also benefits Twitter. Twitter, as we know, considered buying SoundCloud uh, last week. Uh, the deal didn't happen, but it definitely shows that uh, Twitter wants to get more involved into the music in, in the music uh, business and keep uh, being relevant within that uh, music demographic. Uh, also, it's going to be interesting to see... Uh, in the long run, because this is being done and the tech is being put in place to track this, uh, you know, how we're going to be able to uh, model that data and look it up against the sales data, like you were mentioning, and uh, gig tickets data and see if there's any correlations and how the Twitter mentions uh, influence those things, even if it's a, a thing that you can only do, you know, uh, posteriorly, uh, you know, after after the event, unfortunately. And uh, and the third thing was actually, I was, I was thinking about press releases, because I get a lot of press releases from uh, PR companies that are saying, you know, our artist uh, got to the number one of the, uh, you know, uh, singer-songwriter iTunes chart in the UK, uh, which is, again, it's a time-relevant uh, chart. So it could have been that the artist was only there for, uh, you know, a day or even a few hours, uh, whilst all the fans bought the release at the same time. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm worried that this is going to happen with the Twitter chart where all the PR companies are going to start adding and our artists reach the number one or the number five or the number seven on the Billboard Twitter chart and you're going to have no notion as to for how long that was, whether it was just for the one 30-minute interval right. or for a longer period of time. So <laughs> Yeah. That's well, I, that, I, I think that's actually a really valid point because I think every, everyone is struggling to find some some way to quantify what they're doing in the marketplace because it's it's not always money. You know, money is hard now, and it's very difficult to it's very difficult to to say, oh, you know, music sales or that's the you know that's single that's a single identifier. It's not really radio airplay because radio airplay is you know terrestrial radio is is you know that that plays a role but not the only role. And now Twitter is is you know is something that is is another you know another mile marker where where bands can say, oh, I achieved this. But but what does it what does that really mean? And I I, I certainly hope that there, I, you know, I certainly hope that there's some data around that of yeah. what it actually does mean to if you rise to the top of, of of Twitter in a particular country for a particular period of time. Does it matter? Yeah. Does it really matter? Does it really matter? But, exactly. But but I do think that I do think that Twitter is, you know, more and more it's a, you know, is what we've seen with a lot of the you know social networks where you know it starts out being about me learning about you, and you know, and friends and and people communicating within a network. And as you know, as these companies go public and as they become very big, they have to monetize. And the way you monetize is to really develop channels yeah. where you can put advertising around that. And the more that Twitter knows about what kinds of music that people are really listening to and where a particular artist has a demographic then they can serve ads to that yeah. so um so that's that's probably where that's probably where all of this is 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 going but i bet you will be inundated with some more press releases in the <laughs> in the near term and uh, uh, there is one more major story but i'm going to leave that till next week hopefully i'm going to be able to get some uh, legal uh, uh, advice on it uh, as far as uh, the uh, implications of it and how it's actually structured uh, and it pertains to universal music uh, essentially uh, uh, filing a couple of uh, 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 summary judgments, two summary judgments motions on Friday that seek to put an end to a number of artist-led uh, lawsuits uh, that were actually aggregated into one class a lawsuit uh, uh, that claimed that the label should have been paying them royalties for digital downloads as if they were licenses rather than sales and there's a bunch of different legal points that uh, I'm not going to go into right now but uh, that's, that's a really interesting story and hopefully I'm going to get somebody yeah. next week uh, from the uh, US uh, uh, legal side of things that can help us uh, make sense of that because there's so many caveats and uh, I don't want to uh, misinform anybody about it and uh, there's a couple of more uh, quick stories that I wanted to go through uh, Vicky uh, I'm gonna uh, sort of uh, zoom through them if there's anything you want to comment on please just jump in and stop me and we'll uh, get right into it and so uh, okay. first of all there's a, a new app called Tunepix that uh, uh, received a, a big feature on the Apple Store at least here in the UK I'm not sure about the US uh, it had a lot of press uh, they had even two pages 
pages of booked uh, of uh, advertising on Wired, as somebody pointed out today on Twitter. And the app is essentially an Instagram that allows you to associate photos with songs. So you, you take a photo, you associate a song that's already in the database, uh, there's a clip of the song playing, and uh, away you go. You browse your feed, uh, and the songs start playing automatically when you get to the photo of uh, that, that a friend has taken. And uh, interesting take, interesting concept. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's uh, any more than a feature within a service uh, or a company that's maybe aiming to get acquired or whether it can actually become a, serving its, a service in its own rights. I'm not sure. Uh, well, I know. And I all, and of course, you know, I, I, so I've been so deep in the, the world where you're trying to marry a great idea with something that's licensable yeah. that consumers are going to care about. And I have always been under the assumption that the music labels and the music publishers view anything where music is running with images as a sync license and that's a very different license um, <laughs> than just running you know and having preview clips and there have right. been a number of, of very high profile companies that have had games and things that are running on preview clips in iOS and they've had to take those down completely dismantle them so um, so I read that I read that article as well as and I and I thought well you know that doesn't really doesn't really say whether or not they checked the 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 legal fine print on that, but um, but I think it's a good idea. I think it's yeah. something that's really natural that people want to do. Whether it's its own service, you know, is, is is up for grabs. But I think that people like to express themselves, and they say, "Wow, this is the best sunset I've ever seen," and it reminds me of this song, and they yeah. want to put those things together. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm sure if if I get the guys at Tunepix uh, on the show at some point in the next few weeks, I'm going to ask them about that as well and put them under pressure a little bit. And uh, uh, also uh, a new app, a new version of uh, DJ. Uh, called DJ2. It's an app for iOS has been released. Uh, the updated app be behaves similarly to an app that we actually uh, talked about a few months ago uh, back in March that was called Pacemaker uh, that allows users to access and mix Spotify's uh, 20 million tracks uh, as a DJ essentially. Uh, uh, you know, DJ2 also has two decks and you can sort of scratch and do all sorts of stuff on the tracks uh, and the app also includes an auto mix feature which is now powered by the Echo Nest Music Intelligence program which makes a lot of sense because the Echo Nest uh, is owned by Spotify and so the company managed to get a deal done with Spotify, then it's all good. Uh, of course, the uh, users need to be uh, premium users of Spotify in order to be able to use the tracks. And Vicky, again, once again, a question of licensing here because uh, uh, I, I, ever since I saw the first app, uh, Pacemaker, I was I was wondering how they got away with it because it starts to be quite an interactive use of the track that is seems to be a little bit beyond. Of course, you can't record any, any of this. It's all like sort of a, a ephemeral but at the same time it does allow you to do quite a lot with the track that uh, uh, perhaps sort of starts threading in, in, in a gray area right right and there are lots of there are lots of these gray areas that in, in music in music licensing where the you may you may look at this you say well in you know in DJ culture you can you know you can mix and scratch and sample and and do a lot of different things um, with with a sound recording but in digital to create an application around that it you get into a very very big vortex of interpretations of rights and I think that from my own experience talking to lots of different labels and and publishers I think that I think there's there is a you know there's a growing sentiment that a lot of uh, a lot of labels and and artists feel like well why not you know if yeah. it's going to if it's going to help my music rise to the top of of 20 million songs and, and it helps uh, in, adding adding users to the premium service of Spotify as well Exactly. Exactly. It's fun, and it's it seems very culturally relevant. Um, but I think that it's it's always the outlier of do you actually know who thinks it's okay and who thinks it isn't okay? And right. and you know, and if if the if if it's just a simple cease and desist, we don't think this is okay. We and you know, remove my song. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient, or are you going to get yourselves into into a lot more more trouble than it's worth? But I think yeah. the fact that it's coming from Echo Nest and Spotify and Spotify Premium, um, I think that gives it a little bit more of a of a of a ring fence safety zone. And of course, it has it. to be it has to be added also that. Uh, 
uh, you know, given my conversation with uh, uh, Andreas from Spotify Business last week, uh, I, w- I would imagine that none of this is uh, has commercial assets attached to it, of course. So uh, a DJ wouldn't actually be allowed to use this app as part of their set, which is a very important point to make. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, you know that's that's probably going to happen anyway, but because uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless you get a, co- a company actually trawling through clubs and looking at uh, a DJ's iPads to figure out what version of Spotify they have, it's, it's going to be hard. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think this is meant, you know, this is not meant for uh, public performance. It's just for right. fun. So we're going to yeah, exactly. And I and I actually and I think from that perspective, I think it's it's great because it the thing about music is that it you know when it when it reflects. You know, when everybody can be in their bedroom, you know, singing into a hairbrush and they can be their own rock star. I mean, that's that's what music has been to many, many people. And now, in you know, instead of, you know, instead of that, it's it's DJs and it's bedroom DJs and it's people who are who are really affected by um, electronic music culture. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's great. And I think that that one of the more heartbreaking things about um, about a lot of these apps that are coming out is, you know, they're there are little bits of functionality that are in or out that can make an enormous difference in whether their licensing uh, costs are, are small, medium, or large. And it may not make any difference at all to the consumer. Yeah. Um, they, they just want to play around with it. And the nice thing about building an app within a Spotify environment is you do have, you do have a lot more interactive, interactivity and a lot more room to play than if you're trying to do it as a standalone. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, uh, Moogfest uh, uh, seems to have lost uh, $1.5 million in the last edition that just happened. Billboard spotted that the festival uh, added this information as part of a grant application which was uh, denied actually by uh, Buncom uh, County and uh, Moog asks for, asked for a grant that was three times the size of the one received last year uh, equivalent to $250,000 and was denied. Uh, so uh, you know we're going to see what happens to the festival next year and how they're going to be able to uh, restructure it in a way that they don't, don't lose so much money and they can keep it going. And uh, finally Hypo reports that a service called called uh, Eximalaya, which appears to be a Chinese version of SoundCloud, has received $11.5 million in VC funding. Uh, the information around the service are pretty uh, spotty and sketchy, but it's going to be interesting to see how that develops, given that uh, there seem, appears to be uh, a Chinese version of almost every other, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> major social media site from the US or Europe. So uh, why not SoundCloud? It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does actually make a lot of sense. And I think that there's, um, you know, within China, there, you, you know, you you really, you know, you don't just drop an international service into China. It doesn't. It really doesn't work. I mean, we saw what happened with Google and what, you know, the, and after Google pulled out, what it did to Baidu. Yeah. You know, just that company just exploded. And um, and I think the I, I think with music, I think that this is a this is actually a really important one to watch. Um, now, because it's uploading and because there is, you know, some semblance there of user generated um, content, you know, that is if China wants to build some sort of a, of a, of a legal, legal marketplace in digital music, I think that this will be, this will be one that, that they'll have to have some sort of controls and yeah. mechanisms in, in, in place. But um, but most of the money that is going to be made in China, I think, is going to be coming through through telcos and different kinds of services and probably the high-profile Chinese artists. And yeah. um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But um, but that's definitely one to watch. Absolutely. And, uh, well, Vicky, it was an absolute pleasure having you on today. I uh, had a lot of fun recording the show. Uh, and I haven't done a one-to-one in a while. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for having me. And uh, uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you're up to at the moment and anything, if there's anything you want to plug at all, uh, that's, that's your time to do it. Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I, I've been, as, as you mentioned, you know, I spent four and a half years, uh, I started up the seven digital business in the US and got, you know, we, you know, did that on my own for two years and then incorporated a US entity, have a small team. And, um, and I just really was ready for a change. And it's a tough business to be in of sitting in between yeah. technology companies and labels and publishers. But I there are a couple, couple really great services that I personally worked on that are not not yet live in the market, and um, and over the next couple of months they should be rolling out, and I think there are definitely some to watch because they're 
quite differentiated than any streaming services that are out there right now. Awesome. Um, and, um, and I'm excited. Uh, Tommy Silverman invited me to come to New Music Seminar. So nice. I'm, going to, I'm going, to, going to go out there. And, um, and it's actually really fun for me because I feel, like it's, I feel like there's so many problems that people are trying to solve. And there's so many exciting things that are happening in the marketplace right now. Yeah. And um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to really take my time before I jump into anything in my usual 120 percent way, <laughs> and uh, and 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 see 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 who's doing see who's doing what out there. That's awesome. Well, again, yeah. it was a great fun, and uh, thanks so much. And thanks so much for listening to the show today. Once again, you can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com, and don't forget to check out uh, the one-to-one show, which also comes out weekly, and where I interview an interesting uh, uh, digital music company or an interesting product. Project that is happening in the space. You can tweet us on at DG Music Trends if you had any comments on what we talked about today or if you'd like to point out new stories. You can also email on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Thanks again so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time. <laughs>